So uh, welcome to uh, the MQ weekly seminar. Today uh, we're happy to welcome back uh, Dale Barker. Dale was, uh, Dale was here a number of years ago, and a number of us know him very well. So uh, Dale is the director of the, uh, of the Center for Climate Research in Singapore. He's directing weather and climate science activities in support of those uh, services. Uh, Dale has a research background in atmospheric data assimilation, use of observations in NWP, and regional climate analysis, reanalysis. He led the WARF data assimilation uh, program here uh, from, uh, at NCAR from 99 to uh, 2009. Uh, after that, he went back home to the UK, initially at the Met Office's uh, data assimilation section, subsequently taking responsibility for all NWP, ocean forecasting, air quality, weather pro products at the uh, Met Office, as the Met Office Associate Director of Weather Science in 2015. He took up his current position at, uh, as CCRS director in August 2020. Dale's a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and of the Royal Meteorological Society. He's visiting professor at the U University of Reading and has uh, held a number of advisory <coughs> positions, most recently as the chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee for the new Kim Korean NWP uh, system. Now, is it true that 80% like, of the people in Korea are named Kim? So that would be a... <laughs> I read that someplace. <laughs> so it's very appropriate. <laughs> okay, uh, Dale is a fellow of well, high-resolution tropical NWP regional climate projections uh, at the Center for Climate Research of Singapore. Yeah. Yeah. Good to be back. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry you didn't get much of a break there between your, those who were here for the tutorial, but uh, if you want to stand up and you know, stretch your legs, feel free. Don't, well, don't worry about that. You won't get any strange looks from me. So uh, yeah, welcome, and thanks for coming along, and also to all my ex-colleagues and friends from M-Cubed and around and other places, so it's great to see people here. So uh, I gave a talk last year, actually. I was, I was here last year, and uh, I, well, I meant to give a talk last year, but uh, due to COVID, I ended up giving the talk from, at 4 a.m. in the morning from a Singapore hotel room after I'd gone back. So uh, hopefully I'll be a little more lucid this time. Uh, but we're just going to provide an update on what's happening at CCRS. Uh, I'm not particularly going to get into any details uh, for data simulation, for example. Sorry, PDN and others. But uh, um, I'll, I'll probably just give a broad flavor of sort of work we do at CCRS and why and who we do it for. So uh, just a brief overview of CCRS. Um, and I want to share this um, Climate Science Research Master Plan. It's a, it's a strategic framework where we're trying to coordinate all of the climate science research within Singapore, whether it's us or universities or, or some of the private sector companies, such as NVIDIA, trying to work together to fill the pieces of the jigsaw to have a, a solution that works for all the Singapore stakeholders. Um, and we don't leave any major gaps uh, left uh, unfilled. Uh, as far as CCRS is concerned, I'll give, I will give a few updates on the primary um, applications and, and modeling areas. And there is a bit of a focus on modeling here. Uh, we're not so much an observation shop, uh, but we, we do uh, run, uh, as you'll see, regional high resolution uh, models on timescales from now casting the next 30 minutes all the way to regional climate projections over the next 100, uh, 200 years. So it's a broad, broad, broad range of timescales, but modeling is, is a key part of what we do. And various applications of the modeling uh, system that we have. Um, and of course, we're all thinking about our next generation models. That's why you're here. Uh, I guess many of you, in terms of the MPAS tutorial, uh, moving on from WARF, so, and you're not alone there, of course, everybody's, pretty much everybody's looking at where they're going to be in five, ten years' time in the next generation of IT infrastructures, the role of data science, uh, GPU architectures, etc. So I'll finish with a brief um, steer or suggestion of where we might go. Um, so for those of you who don't know uh, Singapore, you won't see it on this map because it's too small. Uh, but where it is, it's this little dot, the little red dot, as they call it, uh, at the southern end of the Malaysian Peninsula, uh, one degree north of the equator. So you can't get much more deep tropics than that. Um, so of course, dominated by, in terms of the large scale drivers, you're familiar with um, um, El Nino, for example, we're just going into El Nino. So the, uh, as, as we get into the um, southwest monsoon season, in Singapore, it's dry. It's going to be even drier because of, uh, because of El Nino. 
Uh, and that, that all adds up to concerns over forest fires and biomass burning in the region and air quality issues in Singapore and the region. So we're in for an interesting time over the next few months uh, due to the El Nino and, and the, uh, the combination of that and the southwest monsoon. Um, of course, MJO coming through the region. Um, we have the Borneo vortex. We have coal surges coming down at certain times of the year. Uh, and essentially, we've, the, these are the large-scale drivers. Uh, but again, Singapore is the tiny little dot there. Um, of course, Singapore is not just concerned about what happens there. 90% of the food from Singapore comes from elsewhere. So it's about food, it's water supplies from Malaysia. It's about uh, yeah, food, water, uh, biodiversity loss in the region, uh, air quality. So it, it, it really is a regional activity that the little red dot needs to stay involved and in the loop with and, and get on with its neighbors. Um, so that's the context of the region in terms of CCRS. I showed this last year, um, but we've been around for 10 years. It's our 10-year anniversary. Uh, and our first director there, Chris Gordon, came from the Met Office. He was head of partnerships at one point and then the head of the Hadley Center. Uh, for those of you who know, uh, in John Petch's previous position as science partnerships, I think John took over from, from Chris. Um, but head of the pa Hadley Center. He, he disappeared about uh, six, seven years ago. Erlen Gillen, director of ECMWF, a research at ECMWF, then took over. And I, I joined in 2020, as, as Rich mentioned. So, yes, we do research. Uh, we, we are interested in the research in the region, but we're part of the National Met Service as well. So we have to deliver uh, what we, what, as well as writing papers, we have to deliver outcomes, um, prediction systems, or, or guidance to government on climate change projections, et cetera. Uh, and again, I'll focus on some of the, uh, the ap actual applications we have, the primary applications. Um, as you can see, we're starting to hone in on Singapore here. This is the uh, Malaysian Peninsula. This is Singapore down here. This is Mal Indonesia. You can see Indonesia in the distance if you look south. Malaysia ac is across the causeway, so it's all very, all very local and international in this part of the world. And Sumatra is over here. And this feature here is what's known as a Sumatra squall, which is quite an exciting, interesting phenomenon that comes over. Typically, in, in the early morning, it typically wakes you up. You get these, uh, you get a few hours of absolutely amazing thunderstorms, which come from don't come from nowhere. They come from Singapore. Uh, from, from Sumatra, but they're one of the most hard things, hardest things to, to predict. And this is an area where predictability is very limited, as you can imagine. Uh, this is dominated by tropical, uh, tropical convection. This is dominated by small-scale localized convection. There's been one remnant of a tropical cyclone in Singapore in the past 30 years. It's not an area, for, so for example, Taiwan, where you have many more tropical cyclones. This is about localized convection and now casting pretty unpredictable uh, weather phenomena. Uh, in terms of CCRS, we're split into, we've actually uh, got a new department uh, this year, the Department of Research Master Planning. It sounds, sounds a, a mouthful, uh, but essentially what we, as well as our own research, we receive funds from the Singapore government to the tune of around $50 million now to uh, defray to the local universities to help spin up local capabilities in weather and climate science. So we, 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 we fund postdocs to work in various projects, whether it be sea level rise, uh, weather research uh, is a new one, or uh, climate impacts uh, research. Uh, we have uh, Department of Climate Research and Department of Weather Research. Uh, again, it's split by the timescales. Um, we have uh, numerical weather prediction, core modeling. You'll, you'll see uh, the seamless modeling. I come from the Met Office. We always talk about seamless modeling, right? So weather and climate timescales. So that's the core modeling development. That's what I mean by core. It's for weather and climate. Um, air quality, as I mentioned. And over this side, I won't talk about some of these things. Seasonal, seasonal prediction, uh, climate impacts, climate projections of the regional climate projections. So I will touch on, touch on those. So that's where we, we are. This is this slide I show, and I'd like to show it because I think it, it, it's a way of representing all the things that we do in climate science and weather science and why, um, and the things we need. So again, I can start at the top or the bottom, but if I start at the top, this is, this is, this is a climate angle, but you could look at it from the weather, weather services as well. Um, in the Singapore government, there are what's known as a resilience working group, which have various clusters of all the sectors that are impacted by climate change. So flood protection, sea level rise, changes in inland flooding, how those two things to go, come together. Water resources uh, is linked to that. Urban heat island, Singapore's a pretty hot, humid place. If it, if it, if, if it goes up by another two or three degrees, the wet bulb globe temperatures, which is the way we measure heat stress in Singapore, are getting to the point where it becomes unlivable. 
So this is a really a big topic, and I'll come back to, to that one shortly. Biodiversity, of course, greenery, um, public health, food security, network infrastructure, etc. Aviation, maritime, finance, finance is obviously massive in a place like Singapore. And I think there's a real, uh, I think that's a direction that uh, several institutes in Singapore are going to link up. The, the, the finance sector gets it in terms of reinsurance or whatever it might be, uh, climate risk, etc. So I think that's a big area for climate impacts in terms of the, the impact on the economy, insurance and finance sector, certainly in a place like Singapore. So that's, that's they're the outcomes we need to deliver. These are the people who want, want our information or want our products and, and, and forecasts. But if I then zone back down to the bottom, um, okay, uh, what, do we need to, what, do we need, what do we need to do our research? Uh, and this is fairly generic across most institutes. I, I could, I could, you, could, you could look at this in terms of NCAR, for example. You know, what you're doing is you're providing modeling systems. You need observations. You need computers to put those things together in weather and climate models, run large simulation on all sorts of timescales. And of course, most importantly, you need the people. You need the, the workshops, the training, the, the science programs, and, and the most important enabler of all for all of this weather and climate research are the people. So this involves uh, education programs in Singapore government, in Singapore universities, uh, tutorials, workshops we host within CCRS. Um, but I won't talk too much about this one. I won't talk too much about observations. I will talk a little more about modeling. Uh, it's my area really and, and the IT infrastructure okay so these are the what we call the enablers okay well, what are you going to do with it with, with those nice uh, kit that nice kit uh, and of course we all want to do something slightly different with the observations and the models depending on where we are and what time scales and what are who our customers are uh, but in terms of Singapore it really is all about tropical urban climate that's what that's that's it right that's all we have um, but it's not, that's the very top level line and we can use models and IT infrastructure and people to, to train up and learn and provide predictions or projections of tropical urban climate for weather and climate timescales. Um, the other thing we need is complexity. We live in the maritime continent in Singapore. It's in the name maritime continent. We can't ignore interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere or the land and the atmosphere. We have to see this as a coupled climate system and so regional climate modelling Coupled climate modeling is a key strategic direction for us. Very localized, but deep tropical, regional coupled climate modeling. I'll come back to that one shortly. Uh, uncertainty, I mentioned the predictability issues, so obviously that's something we have to deal with. And then again, past, present, and future is essentially from reanalysis to now casting all the way out to hundreds of years in the future for climate change projections. So these are, these are the areas, it's, these, it's already quite broad for a, a, a research institute that's only 60 people. So international collaborations are, are key to what we do. Uh, but through these research activities, we can choose, uh, we can deliver to the people who, who fund us essentially. So it's all about delivering outcomes that are relevant to Singapore stakeholders. So we can't do everything, so we choose these strategic areas to focus on. And I'll say a little bit more about um, what we're actually doing in that uh, underpinning climate science region. Okay, um, so we're a unified model partnership. For those of you, I think most of you know what the unified model is. It's a consortium built around the Met Office's uh, um, unified model with the weather and climate. I mean, in, in this sense, unified means weather and climate timescales. Um, so it's been around for 20 or 30 years. Um, I think in terms of the, the success, what works well, I mean, there's good access to a very sophisticated model, uh, active collaborations. I mean, there's around a th there is over a th thousand scientists within the community. So I think that's one of the strengths of this kind of collaboration. Over a thousand climate weather scientists working in the same modeling framework is a pretty powerful uh, consortium in activity. Uh, the governance. I'll credit John here. John was the UM, was the, one of the uh, the, the UM uh, partner um, UM uh, partnership team leads. Uh, performance. I'll show some examples how it performs in the deep tropics. Uh, but it, again, it's a global regional. Um, that's the other aspect. Global regional unified. Uh, it, this all works well. Um, one of the things we get for free, actually, which is quite good in Singapore, and I'll give you a sneak in terms of what we do in terms of data simulation. Uh, this is our domain here. This is our one and a half kilometer. Uh, Sing V um, DA data simulation NWP. Uh, it's around. It's, it's one and a half kilometer resolution. It cycles three hourly, three uh, D var. DA techniques could be improved. We know, uh, but in terms of the observations, there's a fairly wide range of observations, both conventional uh, satellite uh, radiances uh, and some of the more esoteric examples coming online. For example, radar data simulation. Um, so that's the unified model. Uh, so what have we done with the unified model? 
Um, so actually, when I was still at the Met Office, we had a project with Singapore uh, 2013, 2018 to develop. It's called SingV. Uh, it's meant to be the variable grid Singapore domain. The variable grid was never implemented, so the V is obsolete or redundant. But anyway, we stuck with the name. Um, so um, yeah, there's, so the, one of the things about the Met Office, uh, the unified modeling system, is unlike some of the other modeling system, there is one physics package. Right? It has the microphysics and it has the, the, the convection schemes, the cloud schemes, the boundary layer schemes, etc. In there, but there's one. There's one. And so when we came to this in um, 2013, the idea was, well, let's take it out of its comfort zone, stick it down in the deep tropics, see what it does, and step back and flinch and see what you get. And indeed, for the first couple of years, what we saw wasn't very pretty at all. Uh, but I think it was a good approach because you learn, you learn, you look into why, why it's not working well. You don't just choose a different physics package. You, you take what you've got, which has the fundamental laws of physics and some sensible uh, logical uh, algorithms in there, and you try and understand what is it about the deep tropics that's different compared to when we, when we run this in the middle latitudes. And so there's some fairly fundamental changes that we implement in terms of moisture convection, uh, moisture conservation, for example, which, which apply everywhere, but you, you just didn't see the in, issues when you ran it in the middle latitudes. You had to take it out of its comfort zone to really see what was going wrong. And so we could fix that, and it looked much better in you know, the climatology of the, of the, of the forecasts and, and, and the predictions looked much better. But it also made, made the middle latitudes applications more consistent. You didn't see much of an impact on performance, but you were doing things much more for the right reasons rather than picking and choosing physics that happened to work well in one area but not another. So it really was a, it, it took longer to do it that way. It took us three or four years to, for the forecasters to look at it and say, yes, that looks like the weather. It, up until that point, they just said, well, I'm not even going to bother objective verification because it never looks like that. So it took a while, but we got there. So it took five years. In the end, it was implemented operationally in 2019. Uh, in that, and that, in, since that time, it's been implemented in a whole variety of applications. Um, so in terms of the domains, um, I won't talk too much about the big one. This is for the aviation application. So as you can imagine, Singapore is a regional hub. Uh, uh, Singapore Airlines, uh, the Civil Aviation Authority of Singapore, very proud, very, it's a very big industry in, in Singapore. Uh, and they want uh, to have good aviation products coming out of the weather prediction systems that we provide. Um, so that's over a necessarily large domain. Um, the one and a half kilometer I showed earlier is this one. This is our workhorse uh, with the data simulation ensemble prediction system. And I'll come back to this, but we also have a, a, a high resolution 300 meters and 100 meters nest, which we call USingV, which is the urban configuration. So I'll talk about most of these shortly. But again, single physical parameterization that we're trying to, if we use it in a different application, we use it and then we see if it works. If it doesn't work, let's, let's pull it apart and see why it doesn't work rather than choosing something else. A few uh, papers there. So just a, one slide on, on compute resources. We've got two new computers this year. Um, this one is, in the big scheme of things, relatively small. This is Utama, uh, um, which is um, our, in our own building. So that's for operational NWP. It's around half a petaflop uh, for the operational NWP. Uh, the majority of our compute resource, around three petaflops this year at least, is up at the National Supercomputing Center in, uh, uh, in Singapore, um, and around three petaflops there. So that's essentially where we do our research, uh, most of our research, uh, which gets translated over to the operational system in pre-operational trial mode. Okay, so um, just a brief overview of some of those applications I talked about. So we've got this basic unified model. Uh, SingV um, configuration, and there are different applications we run it in. So I acknowledge Song Chen, who's a research scientist within CCRS, who's, who's, who's done most of this work with, with the colleagues within, within Singapore, and, and also the Met Office, for example, the unit group at University of Reading, uh, the Met Office at Reading Group under Humphrey Lean. Okay, so I say the little red dot, um, again, a highly urbanized tropical coast city, um, deep tropics, highly heterogeneous, um, and again, we all, we all know this, but of course the boundary layer, we all live in it. I mean, that's the most important thing, why it's, uh, why it's important. But on weather prediction, uh, time scales for the, for the localized thunderstorms, et cetera, climate projections too, urban heat island, air quality. Um, so I think on this, this kind of application, I think some, some applications are looking more at weather forecasting. We're looking at climate in Singapore. Climate is the dominant application for urban modeling. 
And the reason for that is that Singapore is planning what Singapore will look like in the next 20 or 30 years. And so what they want to do, and they know the climate is changing, and what they want to put together is to optimize future Singapore to match, to, to offset global warming in future climate. So we take our regional climate projections and we work with the agencies, the, the Housing Development Board or the Ministry of National Development and, and scenario plan. So this is about climate scenarios. It's not about SSPs in CMIP6. This is about, okay, if we plant a million trees, what's the impact on the urban climate? If we paint all our buildings in cooling paints technology, which is a big thing in Singapore at the moment, what's the impact on, on, on the heat stress? So uh, if we, all our cars were electric, if we reduce the efficiency of air conditioners by 50%, What's the impact on the local climate? So it's not so much driven by, at this stage at least, not driven by weather prediction. That will come, but at the moment it's driven by urban climate, urban planning. And uh, it's quite an impressive uh, activity that you, you can actually think that far ahead and, and plan. But somewhere like Singapore is quite integrated, right? So uh, it's, it's an exciting, interesting uh, change from somewhere like the UK, I guess, where I won't go, I won't go there, but... Uh, <laughs> This is not recording, it is recording. Oh no, I'm in trouble. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, it's an interesting application. Um, of course, whether you believe the results or not depends on the quality of the, you know, the simulations and the models you're using. So we always provide that caveat. This is not a black box. This is an imperfect thing. So all those things about uncertainty and different scenarios uh, is, is, is key. So using V, um, this is the domain uh, in here. This is a really nice application for a stretch grid. This is something I've been talking about this week with, with people here. Uh, if we could, rather than having a sort of telescoping down through three nests, having a single stretch grid that goes down to 100 meters from a, from a kilometer, that would be a really nice application, wouldn't it? Uh, challenges there with uh, scale aware physics, etc. but that would be quite a nice way forward. And yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, currently, we are uh, using the unified model, uh, which has the, the triple nests. The Marusa's urban canopy model, again, the nesting, uh, there's a lot of good data in terms of urban fraction or land uh, vegetation type, etc., down to meter scale in Singapore. So um, it's, it's a really uh, good data set. We can't use all the data. We use less than 1% of the data we, we could have available to us. We, the models can't use this information yet. Uh, but here's an urban fraction, for example. This is, you can see the developments coming up in South Malaysia. This is Johor across the causeway, so it's not just about the urbanization of Singapore, it's Malaysia is actually urbanizing quite quickly, here, just north of, the, north of the causeway as well. Um, so if we look at the, again, this is a relatively early, early application, this is a, a research topic at the moment, but looking at the, uh, the, um, you know, the, the, the vertical, um, vertical velocities or the, the t t TKE spectrum, you can see it's dropping off because there's not much power in those smaller scales. Um, so, you know, I think this is part of the research is how do we, how do we work on this? You're getting down to, this is around kilometer here, uh, sub-kilometer scale, the power's dropping off pretty quickly. And this is at the urban 100 meter scale model. So, um, it's getting something, you'll see shortly it's, it's doing some sensible things at those scales, but uh, again, in terms of the, the KE spectrum, it's, uh, it's some work to be done. Early evaluation in terms of, uh, against flux towers. Uh, so what we've got here is uh, all wave radiation and there's sensible heat and latent heat. You can imagine a place like, humid place like Singapore, latent heat's quite a big, quite a lot of a latent heat around, right? So, um, but again, just verification of the model against the, uh, the observed for the, uh, the D1 is the 100 meters and D3. So you're starting to see some, at least in the sensible heat, some impact on the um, representation of the uh, fluxes, um, the sensible heat fluxes at least. So the observation is black. So you can see the 300 meter is in blue and the 100 meter. So it, it, there's something, it's starting to look like it's adding some value, at least in this, in this metric. Um, not so much for the, uh, the latent heat, so for example. So questions about what is the impact of the resolution on, on, the, on your humidity and the latent heat profiling, et cetera, of the, of the high resolution model. It's not doing what we expect it to do. It's a more complicated uh, diurnal trend in humidity compared to temperature. Uh, but again, this is the kind of research that uh, we're working with the universities to try and understand and, and improve the models to, to um, look at, improve these climatologies for sub-kilometer scale climate modeling. Um, again, there's just a, this is very early work, but in terms of just a few simulations running this and looking at the climatologies of 1.5 kilometer air temperature. 
So again, here's Singapore, this is air temperature. You can see, this is uh, Jurong Island, which is where all the oil, oil refineries are. So you can see the, uh, the impact of the concrete and uh, uh, other things out here. Um, and we've got uh, the D1, this is the one kilometer, sorry, 100 meter. So again, in terms of through the day, it gets the rough diurnal cycle. The, the peak during the afternoon, early afternoon is, is pretty accurate, but again, there's a, a variation there. But again, early, early studies to look at uh, the climatologies and the simulations uh, in terms of surface temperature. Surface winds, again, uh, obviously sort of the impacts of the coast, the coastal winds depends on the time of year, of course, and the, uh, which monsoon season we're in. Again, a more complicated, uh, more, more variable representation through the day, depending on, uh, depending on the conditions and the season. But again, there's, and there seems to be a bit of an issue with the timing here in terms of the maximum winds. Um, I think one of the things we see here with this is this is atmosphere only. So one of the issues here is how do we, and this is, this is, this is calling out for the impact of the ocean and with the diurnal, uh, diurnally varying SST, for example, to look at the impact of the changing sea surface temperatures around the coast of Singapore on the weather through sea breezes, etc. So again, some good research to be done, but early days. Uh, some eye candy here, just in terms of some of the simulations in the 100 meter run. So you can see the, again in this example, this is the south, uh, southwest monsoon season. And again, just during the time of day, you can see the clouds um, spinning up and initiating a, a, around the late, um, early afternoon uh, and then going away again. Okay, that looks good. Does that look like anything like reality? Um, so for the same time, uh, just Two snapshots here, 11 and 12, uh, and this is the local Sentinel 2A um, imagery during around, around the same time. So essentially, you're, still, you're seeing the, the feature, you're seeing these lines of convection uh, predominantly in the same direction. It, it's not going to be in the same place. We don't expect it to, but in terms of climatologically, you're seeing the sorts of features that we observe from the imagery data at the sort of scales that we, we see and at the same times of day as we see in the observations. So I think that's a... There's, there's something good that's happening here, again, in terms of the detail variation, um, surface exchanges, et cetera, and the impact of the ocean, that's still to be decided. And, and more, a lot more research to be done in this. But this is tropical urban climate. This is our bread and butter. I think just one more on the urban application. Uh, I mentioned the impact of, on urban planning. So, so, for example, the representation of anthropogenic heat, you know, the heat that's produced by humans air conditioners or cars or whatever it might be. It's not, it's not about the, the heat that's coming off Changi Airfield runway, it's about the heat that people produce themselves, the humans themselves producing heat or, or air conditioners or whatever it might be. So again, representations, we work with the National University of Singapore, for example, to look at the, you know, what, what, what the distribution is, model the distribution of anthropogenic heat in terms of uh, air conditioning or, or industry, um, whatever it might be. And then we can simulate that in the model to try and, you know, with and without that heat, what's the impact of human heat on the climate and the weather? So there's two examples here where we're simulating the impact without any anthropogenic heating and with the anthropogenic heating profile. Uh, and this is a difference here. So you can see the impact is mainly downtown. This is downtown Singapore in this part of the world. Uh, uh, but it could be around 0.5 degree. So, you know, you combine the... Uh, climate change, global warming, with the impact of the urban environment, the heat coming off the buildings, et cetera, and the impact of the human heat from cars or from air conditioners, whatever. You can see these, these are all significant terms. Um, and, and for Singapore, they're, they're, they're taking quite a positive attitude to this because uh, the simulations show that actually you can more than offset the impact of climate, global warming if you do sensible things about human heat, if you do sensible things about cooled, cooled, cooled paints or aligning the, the streets to align with the wind directions and build them to a certain height where you can optimize the heat stress. And, and so you can actually, there's a whole, whole industry in Singapore about how you can actually mitigate against global warming, which they can't do anything about in Singapore. They're, they're such a small, they can't do anything about that. But what they can do is change Singapore so it can mitigate against that broader picture. Same as sea level rise, of course, building sea, that's more crew, that's building sea, sea walls, et cetera. But this is much more subtle and quite, quite sophisticated. Okay, so that's the urban application. Um, I'll talk, I did talk, allude to a bit about the, this is the maritime continent and the role of the ocean is, is quite important in this part of the world as, as it is increasingly in many modeling systems. Most 
climate models have had coupled ocean for decades, right? Um, most modern global NWP systems have coupled models from day zero, day one. Some are getting coupled data simulation in there. So coupled modeling is there weather and climate timescales. Uh, in many applications around the world, and for someone like the maritime continent, it's a no-brainer. It has to be there. I've said some of this already, uh, but in terms of the Southeast Asia's maritime continent, um, you know, the heat exchange between the ocean and the land and the, and, uh, and the atmosphere in that part of the world, it, it's a huge amount of energy exchange, which is a real contributor to the global climate system. So it's not just us who are interested in this, in this region, it's, it's the global climate models, right? Um, so, so yeah, again, it means we need new collaborations. We need to work with the oceanographers, the hydrologists, uh, the air quality specialists, a uh, whole host of different, um, um, not just meteorologists and data simulation people now. We have to work across different organizations and different, um, different fields of science. Um, but one of, the one of the outcomes of this, of course, we, we do this for, maybe do this for science reasons, but if you're doing this properly, in, for example, a coupled ocean atmosphere wave land system, which is coupled through something like the OASIS MCI, uh, MCT coupler, you can start to represent the interactions, the air sea interactions, the, um, the land air interactions, etc. So again, this is built on collaboration. It's been around for about eight years now with the Met Office, um, but we've taken the system working with the Met Office and now running it in the deep tropics um, and trying to understand which are the important processes. Is it just about the diurnal cycle of SSTs or is it about the air sea interactions, the sea breezes? I mean, what's the relative role of these different uh, cross-boundary uh, processes um, in terms of improving the climate or, or understa better un understanding the weather and climate of the region. Um, I always put this one, in the, the, the one of the challenges when we start talking about the marine environment, the South China Sea, for a variety of reasons, is pretty data sparse. Uh, it's the bathymetry of it. It's the fairly shallow sea, so Argo floats don't really, don't really work too well in there. Uh, it's piracy. It's politics. It's a whole series of things that basically mean that you get some fantastic observations from space, from polar orbiters and geostationary. But in terms of in situ, below the surface, very little information. And you can imagine, given in terms of the complex ocean currents and the flows and the salinity, the, 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 the river inflows, uh, the impact of regional ocean model changes on climate change could be quite significant. So it's a real weak spot in our, in our arsenal that we just don't have the observations to better understand the current climate of the ocean environment, let alone how it might change in the future. So I think it's an area where we are somewhat handicapped due to the lack of observations, but we do what we can, but that's, a, um, and that's, that, that's where we are. Okay, so, so th this work goes back a few years now, 2019. Um, B. Joy Thompson at the National University of Singapore, working with uh, Claudio Sanchez at the Met Office and, and CCRS staff, developed the initial coupled ocean atmosphere uh, system called C-SingV, coupled SingV. So at that time, it was four and a half uh, kilometer of a fairly large domain. It was targeted at regional climate projection applications. Um, but now we realize we're not gonna get to regional climate projections until CMIP 7, which is 2027, 20, 2028, or maybe later even, if they do it in these kind of modeling systems at all. Uh, but it certainly uh, wasn't ready for V3, our regional climate projections, which are the atmosphere only ones now. So that was, uh, showed some promising results. Uh, but since that time, uh, we've, I mean, we realize that four and a half kilometers is really, really low resolution for the region, given the complex bathymetry. You can see, um, you know, this is a sort of a 10,000 meter shelf or 8,000 meter shelf here off the west coast of, of Sumatra. Uh, but then again, you've got this, this is the Sunda shelf and you have all this high, high, uh, high fidelity coastal effects that you're starting to resolve some of the eddies, some of the issues off the coast of Banda Aceh, for example, the eddies that turn off up here, which is where they had the big tsunami in 2004. So there's some really uh, localized ocean wave, and wave I'll come to, effects in this region that means this sort of resolution wasn't really enough. You, Singapore was part of the Malaysian land. There was no, Singapore wasn't an island in these kind of simulations. It's only just an island in these ones, but uh, it's a factor of three increase anyhow. So. That's where we are. You can see some of the details in terms of the configuration now. Uh, we spent two or three years optimizing this NEMO configuration. This is the NEMO ocean model with the atmosphere of SingV on top. Um, 
working with the National Oceanographic Centre and the Met Office again in, in the UK. Um, I think we're fairly comfortable with this configuration now. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll show some results shortly in terms of the performance of the system, but uh, the new thing we've added uh, in the past year or so is, is, the wa is the WAVE system, and that's WAVE Watch 3. Um, and so and we're using the SMC uh, grid capability for those of you who are WAVE modelers, where you can actually have a sort of, str not stretch grid, but a, a variable resolution uh, where you can have cells that differ in um, size. So, for example, where the sea is, uh, depth is greater than 40 meters, it's three kilometers, but as soon as it starts to get on the shelf, you can go down to one and a half. And of course, you, you, could, you could play with this and make it more and more uh, fine scale as you go towards, say, for example, Singapore here. But again, this initial one is just demonstrating the SMC approach with three to one and a half, depending on the, on, on the depth of the ocean. So in terms of evaluation of that, um, this is looking at the... So now we're, now we're coupling ocean and wave. We're not bringing in the atmosphere just yet. This is just coupling ocean and wave. Um, in terms of significant wave height, uh, the impact of the coupled ocean wave is not significant. If we just look at validation against JSON 2 significant wave height satellite observations, the RMS, the mean square area, is pretty similar. Uh, it's not particularly doing anything, uh, adding any particular value to the wave. But if we look at the, if we look at the impact on the sur sea surface temperatures, of the mixing of the ocean and the waves is a positive impact. So again, if we're having a coupled ocean wave system, it's not necessarily to improve the waves, but through that mixing, you improve the coupled system and the, and the top few layers, uh, top, top 10 meters or so of the ocean in the region, which is, has bigger impact on the weather than the waves. I mean, now the weather affects the waves, not so much the other way around, but the sea surface temperature has a big impact on the weather, right? So, uh, especially if there's the diurnal cycle. So you put it all together, um, and we get an, an ocean wave, uh, just ocean, ocean, sorry, I can't see it. Uh, the, this one is the, uh, get my glasses on, this is quite small, you probably can't see it either. So the, the verification is Ostia, which is the five kilometer uh, global sea, sea surface temperature analysis produced by the Met Office. So that's our truth, as it were. Um, so we've got the ocean only. In, in orange, and then we have the coupled ocean wave, and this is SST. So again, you can see that the ocean wave coupling is producing a nice um, impact or improvement in terms of the um, sea surface temperatures. So down here, we see in terms of the ocean only with no wave coupling, we're getting some quite large biases uh, compared to Ostia in the Straits of Malacca here. This is the Straits of Malacca. That sort of goes away when you couple it, but there's this interesting impact. There's something going on on the, on the lee side or the uh, eastern coasts of Malaysia and, uh, and Sumatra that we not, don't quite understand. So it, it, it's better, but there are still some issues there in terms of the, the interactions of the ocean and the, and the waves on the, uh, in some parts, predominantly the, uh, the eastern coasts of the Malaysia and Sumatra um, areas. Okay, so that's, um, that's all I wanted to say on a couple of stuff. But again, as we move forward, this is, this, is the, this is the modeling system we need to be running in both weather and climate timescales. And of course, that leads to, on weather timescales, it leads to coupled data assimilation uh, with the ocean data assimilate, et cetera. But at the moment, this is, again, driven by the climate application, trying to understand the impact of the coupled ocean on, on our impact on our regional climate projections accuracy. Okay, so local NWP, I've talked about this one before. I'm not going to talk about this uh, too much now. Um, I've said quite a bit this already. Um, obviously, localized heavy rainfall, key forecast challenges, etc. cetera. Um, of course, this is very much a probabilistic, as most uh, NWP systems are these days. The primary system is the ensemble, uh, and so our products are coming out. And precip, for example, is a probability of precipitation for a particular threshold. Right? It's, not a, it's not a deterministic forecast, certainly in this part of the world. So the probabil probability of uh, precipitation is the way we, we want to uh, provide that information in, in to, our, to our users. And this is, again, meteograms. You've seen meteograms from various centers, but again, seeing the spread and the uncertainty representation. Um, we run this out to about 20, 36 or four, yeah, 48 hours. So um, again, um, whether there's much value at that, at that time is, is an open question, but that's, that's, the, that's the time scale at which our customers want the information from our system. So uh, that, that's partly why we're doing it. But uh, yeah, 
And yeah, you can see the, the, the probability precipitation there for that, that forecast. OK, um, oh, I think if we're, all, if we're running regional NWP systems at all, I think we should always be asking ourselves, what value are we adding in terms of what we could be getting from global NWP? Right? If you're not adding value, then why bother? Um, and so uh, to us, uh, the baseline is always, what's the performance of the global system for particular metrics in our particular domain against particular observations? And what, and what, what added value is there versus, um, versus uh, for, from our uh, regional system? So we've been very clear that ever since the start, this goes all the way, oh, excuse me, this goes all the way back to 2019 before it was, up, actually that's when it's first operationalized. To understand, um, are we adding value on top of the ECMWF NWP forecast, which as you probably all know, is the number one in the world by quite a long stretch. So um, what we did was, first of all, we chose the best global NWP system as our driving model um, because we found early on that one of the best things you can do about your regional NWP performance is to drive it from the best global model you can get your hands on. And the obvious contender is ECMWF. Um, bigger than any change, we tested WARF, we tested uh, UM in various configurations, and the differences were this large. You change between freely available NCEP, GFS, pressure level data, and you run with ECMWF model level data, the difference is this big. So, you know, even more so. Do the first thing you should do, if you're, if you're focused just on regional NWP, is get your hands on the best global NWP to drive your regional system as you possibly can. It's, it's, a, it's, it's the biggest impact we've ever seen in, in regional NWP. Okay, so having got that, now we have a regional modeling system. We want to make it better. We want the products to be better. And so this slide here uh, is essentially uh, quantifying how much better it is. It's a little hard to read, but essentially green is better, purple is worse. And the size of the triangles indicates how much better it is. Um, this is around, five, again, I, I won't go into, this is maybe a qualitative assessment at this stage, but the, the basic message is that it is adding value for many different thresholds of rainfall. Uh, and this is essentially a 24-hour forecast. So a highly predictable environment like the deep tropics, we're still adding value at 24 hours out. Uh, so there's some predictability there, and it's better than what the global models can do. Uh, but we are running at one and a half kilometer compared to ECMWF deterministic, which is nine. But still, it's pretty hard to do to beat ECMWF. Uh, but this, and this shows consistently that we're we're doing it. We were looking at the last one, having a bit of a concern that ECMWF have just had an upgrade and we might have actually, uh, it's gonna be, you know, the global models are getting better and better. ECMW still gets better and better. So it's, you can't just rest, rest on your laurels, you have to keep beating it. <laughs> so you will, you will benefit from the better lateral boundary conditions in your regional system, but it's no guarantees you're still gonna beat it. You have to keep comparing. Um, so there, there's some lessons learned over 10 or 20 years of running regional NWP and looking at its performance and, and asking this question, am I adding value or is this just computer games? <laughs> okay, moving on from that one. Right, uh, I need to wrap up soon. Uh, again, I apologize, I talked about this one uh, last year a bit. I can't share too many of the results because um, they need to go all the way up to, uh, like tomorrow there's a meeting of the in, in, interministerial Committee on Climate Change in Singapore to present the, some of the results, which I'm not showing here, I'm not allowed to. Um, but you know, they have to get the comms right. The, the, the results are coming out. There's some differences to the previous time that CCRS did this five years ago. The results, as you might imagine, uh, are gonna have some implications and we just need to make sure that we are prepared for the consequences when we release these results to the public in January 2024. So, I, I'm not giving too much away by saying the basic results are similar in terms of the magnitude to five years ago when we did this. Of course, CMIP 5 to CMIP 6, we know what the changes are. So some of the changes that have happened, for example, the acceleration of sea level rise over the past um, 10 years and, and the, the acceleration of uh, ice loss from Greenland and Antarctica, for example, that's well known at the global scale. But these, this is really just adding value, um, Again, in terms of the regional uh, climate, weather, temperature, uh, sorry, temperature, um, et cetera. 
Um, so again, I don't need to go, hopefully don't need to do too much details. But essentially we're using the SingV system again, uh, but we're running at much higher resolution than we did, actually the Met Office did uh, five, 2015. At that point they were running this domain over 12 kilometers. Uh, with an older model, and now over the V3 projections, we've run essentially a bit larger than the Cordex Southeast Asia domain, for those of you familiar with WCRP and Cordex, uh, eight kilometer, and then we have a high resolution nest here for some of the simulations at two kilometer. That's essentially our NWP domain. But of course, in the climate projections, we have to make an effort to, to analyze the larger scales. Um, so yeah, again, just seeing the, the, the sort of grid versus the size of Singapore, it's not, not that larger larger place, but again, this is about regional stuff. So the impact on one of the projects we are kicking off is the impact of climate change on Thailand rice yields, because Singapore gets a lot of its rice from Thailand, for example. Malaysian palm oil, um, Malaysian leafy vegetables, tomatoes. So you know, there, there are particular sectors that are really interested to understand water resources in the region, uh, drought prevalence, uh, defense even, impact on migration and social cohesion these are all studies that people are starting to kick off, given the information, localized information on climate change. So again, this is going to be, a, it took us three, three years to produce the data. It's about 10 petabytes of data in, in whole. Uh, but again, there's going to be a lot of, uh, hopefully a lot of users in this part of the world, not just in Singapore for this, for this data going forward. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I won't, I won't dwell on the details, but of course you don't just rely on one GCM to drive your regional climate models. We, we chose six, and there was a careful sub-selection of the CMIP6 models that we chose. And again, using different scenarios, three of the scenarios we, we chose to run in the ASSPs. Um, oh, go about that one. Okay, so my last couple of slides. Um, as I said earlier, the, the modeling systems need to evolve. The unified modeling system is somewhere between 20 and 30 years old. Uh, as many systems are, getting, getting old in the tooth. Even WARF now is 20, 20, 20 25 years old, right? So uh, we all need to move on, I think. Um, so in terms of why, um, again, I think this is fairly generic. Hardware scalability issues, end of Morse or Denard scaling, novel architectures. I've talked about some of this before. One of what I haven't talked about is the demand for green computing. Um, right, running regional climate projections, which produce thousands of tons of CO2, is not a good look. Uh, so it's, a, it's an issue for everybody, but a green computing for climate science and weather predict is, is, I think, a really important topic. Uh, we've got to practice what we preach and not be part of the problem, right? So um, whether it be running on HPCs in northern Finland using hydropower and using the heat produced to cool the city down, which is what Lumi is doing in Europe, or, or actually changing the hardware to make it more efficient. Uh, it's the best they can do in Singapore, given there is no real um, wind power. It's, it's the doldrums, right? The deep tropics. Uh, solar power is, is possible, but Singapore's a small place, so they're not going to get much from that. So in the future, where we get to hydrogen and ammonia-powered uh, power stations or whatever, then that might be a renewable source. But the, for the next 10 years or so, it's going to be fossil fuels. So um, you know, working internationally to run our um, systems on with countries that do have renewable power is something we're looking into, for example. Um, so the software, again, needs to adjust to these, this new hardware. It's old. We need to do new, new science exa example for the couple of systems. And data science is a big one, which I don't have time to talk about today. Um, this is a, John will be familiar with this. This is the, this is the NGMS program uh, led by the Met Office. But the Met Office and the Unified Model Partnership are moving post-UM system is called NGMS, the Next Generation Modeling System. A huge effort, I think the last count is about 90 FDEs per year being invested at the Met Office in this activity. So this is not, this is not chump change in terms of a, a side issue. This is diverting significant resources from, uh, from the current system. Um, and some of these areas we can get into soon and some of these areas you'll be familiar with. So NGPO, that's the Processing and Simulation of Observations, that's JEDI. So the Met Office and all the NGMS partners are looking towards JEDI to run with the next generation model. It won't be the in-house Met Office uh, data simulation capabilities. So it will be JEDI. So again, commonality there that if MPAS is using JEDI, uh, the UN partnership is using JEDI. JCSDA, of course, have all their fantastic partners and applications using JEDI. I think the whole world is, a lot of the world is, is, is condensing on JEDI in one form or another. So uh, something to, to ponder and the implications of that. But the Met Office is, is, is contributing quite significantly. As a UN partner that's focused on tropical regional, um, 
we're not quite at the top of the priorities list at the moment, because as you can imagine, often when you're, as happened with MPAS, it happened with the UM, it happens of course with ECMWF, you start with a global, uh, and then you think about the regional later, typically. It's not the right way to do it for someone like Singapore. Um, so uh, we're looking at the priorities of an urban scale climate weather modeling system uh, that's coupled for our, for our applications. And it, it, so in terms of global NWP, it's not so much of interest to us at the moment. Of course, we will benefit from the work that happens there down the line, but we don't want to wait five or six years uh, for that work to happen and everybody to move to, to urban scale again. We, we, need to, we need to accelerate and we can hopefully contribute towards the broader effort in that area because that's our niche. Um, so again, just summarizing our niche, the top line is weather, the bottom line is climate. I've talked about the, the urban climate stuff. Uh, now casting, I haven't talked about, that's, that's uh, very much a, 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 a data-driven data, data science machine learning application these days. Um, the, the red box is essentially where the, the core modeling development is, is applied. Moving forward, I talked about a uh, couple system, we talk about environmental prediction. It's not just about weather prediction. You're in predicting the environment, you're predicting the, the air quality, you're predicting the, the ocean forecast, you're predicting the biogeochemical, you know, the, the, the ocean color in, in Straits of Malacca. You know, these, these are all things you can be doing in a couple system. It's not just about the weather anymore. Uh, and again, on the, on the climate equivalent side, we've got the next generation of uh, regional climate projections. If if they will go ahead, they will be coupled and we prototype V4 system based on the CC mean system. So that's, um, that's the systems we, used to, we need to replace. They're UM based in the red box. Um, so I'll finish there. Um, I mentioned that CCRS is a research institute, but part of the National Met Service. So we, we, we're conscious about the, the outcomes. It's not just about papers, it's about, we do write papers and that's one of our metrics, but it's, it's about the outcomes for our stakeholders in Singapore. Um, and again, I, I, this, excuse me, is a typo, CSRMP, that should be Climate Science Research Master Plan, that, that broad picture of how it all fits together, I think is applicable generally for many different countries and many different national weather climate science activities, but the difference is in that middle layer. What's our priority? What's our, for, for our research? We can't do everything. Nobody can do everything. So what's, what are we really interested in? And it's tropical urban climate. Um, so I think uh, that's probably all I want to say. So. I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, George? Uh, thanks for an interesting talk, Dale. Um, thanks, can I ask two technical questions, not too far <coughs> into the Try. weeds? Um, the first is you, you run on various meshes from eight kilometers down to 100 meters. I was curious, where do you turn off your convective parameterization and how, if you do, how do you decide, how did you decide where to do that? Um, so it's only the eight kilometer large regional, uh, regional climate projection application that runs with the convection switched on. So everything else is, is explicit. There were some studies done in the early Sing V project, uh, Stuart Webster from the Met Office was involved in those. He was, he was looking at the impacts of different, different, different resolutions um, we, f we found generally the impact of resolution was, was quite limited, actually, compared to, to, to improving some of the parameterization schemes. So uh, it was a bit of a no-brainer to switch to the, the explicit convection off. It did have a positive impact, but anything below, yeah, it's the, only the eight kilometers. So the, all the other ones are two kilometer or higher resolution. They're all explicit. Okay, cool. Thanks for uh, clarifying that. And the other is a, that interesting figure you had with all the green and purple triangles yeah. Pointing up and down. What yeah. I, I'm sitting kind of far away. What are some of the metrics that you're looking at, and what's the purple one in the bottom line that just CMWF <laughs> kicking your butt? The, the eye is drawn to that one, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so this is fractional. This is this is rainfall. So I should have explained it. This is rainfall. This is fractional skill score. So um, when I asked what the priorities for prediction in Singapore were, number one is rainfall. Number two is rainfall. Number three is rainfall. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, um, so it, fraction, fractional skill score. This is, this, this is the Hinton diagram, which is typical of, uh, you'll see this a lot from the Unified Model Partnership. Uh, it's based on fractional skill score, and it's the delta between the, the fractional skill score, uh, weight, normalized between the, the, that and the, the ECMWF, essentially. So these are the different uh, percentiles and thresholds. So you have one, three, 10, 300, and then the 
percent, uh, yeah, percentiles there. So yeah, this one, I, I, I keep saying we should take it off because who, <laughs> who cares about one millimeter of rain <laughs> uh, in terms of impacts? Um, I don't have a satisfactory answer of why the ECMWF system produces consistently better fractional skill scores for one millimeter an hour rainfall. Uh, it may be a smoothing issue, it may be an issue with the observations, I, I really don't know, but what we're really interested in is, is, is up here, right? This is the intense rainfall, so, um, yeah, I should really take that off and stop people asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dale, Joseph here. So, Hi, Joseph. Um, you have, like, there's a lot of really exciting research work that's going on in the maritime continent that's funded by uh, the CCRS folks. <clears throat> in uh, the master research plan thing. So I was wondering like if an international, like if, if like you wanna have international collaborations, like what is the pathway to doing that? Cause I mean, the Singapore's version of NSF doesn't fund overseas stuff directly. So, so what's the Correct. pathway to get into it? Correct, there, there is a bit of a hot, as you, as you well know Joe, there's a hard line between the government funding for, for the Ministry of Finance, which comes to us. So we get funding, we have CapEx and we have our own staff. We also have funds to fund internationally. And we've funded the Met Office. We funded NCAR in the past, actually. Actually, before I was at CCRS, the CCRS, they funded the Met Office. Um, we funded NCAR in the past to do some WARF, some of that WARF UM comparison stuff. We, um, so they're funding directly for us, and that can go international. Uh, the, the money you're referring to from the National Research Foundation, or NSF equivalent in Singapore, can only go to the university. We, can't, we, 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 can, we can manage it. So I mentioned uh, the $40 million of money we get from the National Science Foundation, uh, NRF, equivalent of NSF. They, the NSF, NRF, sorry, give that to us, and we can't touch it. <laughs> we go to the Ministry of Finance to have the program managed to manage uh, so that's where the Department of Research Master Planning is, they're program managers. And then we can bring in the funds from the National Research Foundation, defray that to local universities. So there's now uh, $50 million that we're managing on behalf of NRF that is going out through three different research programs. There's the National Sea Level Research Program, five projects under that with the universities. And they have international partners. So in terms of your question, how do you get involved? I think the short answer is get involved with the universities for the, Nas for the National Research Founding, uh, Foundation money. So uh, you, you mentioned um, refineries in Singapore. Yeah. Um, how are you dealing with aerosol cloud interactions in your modeling system? Uh, very good question. Um, John may be able to answer that one better than myself. <laughs> Thanks, John, for coming along. <laughs> John Petch, new CD, NCAR CDD director. John, sorry, I, I, oh, how would I know? I don't work at the Met Office. I work at CGD. Um, no, it, it's got, it, there's, there are, it depends on how you set up the, the source terms, but there's generally a, it tries to use something that it calls Merck, which is a kind of single source all aerosol that interacts with the clouds and, and, and makes the, you know, so it, it's a, it, it's trying to represent a, a, the whole of all the different aerosols in one prognostic, essentially. But the source terms are really key. And if you've got those in, then it can do some of that cloud aerosol interaction to some extent, basically. Mm. I, I was gonna ask a question. <laughs> now I've got the microphone. I, I was kind of interested in your perspective on the energy spectra because um, you're running at 100 metres, which is what a resolution of, let's say, 500 metres. Mm. It yeah. wasn't wildly out from where the energy was dropping off, where you think that the resolution cut off is. So why did you have such a high expectation of it being better than that? <laughs> um, I, it just seemed to drop off dramatically at around 500 metres, which, which, which is probably what you expect with the 5 Delta X. Yeah. Right. So, so, so maybe, four, five, maybe, the, maybe, um, maybe that's not so unexpected. Um, but if we are... So one thing this is doing is actually, f we're not necessarily using that information. So again, it's not perhaps expected and perhaps not such a big issue because what the system is being used for is to provide the driving mesoscale data for microscale models. 
So there are a couple of microscale models at Palm for you, Fast Eddie in RAL, that kind of microscale modeling LES type system. So we're not we're not trying to get down to re result, truly resolving 100 meters. We're providing the mesoscale environment that microscale models can then use to get down to street level or, or whatever it might be. So so maybe I shouldn't be worrying about it too much. Thanks, John. Okay, we're uh, I think we're at our three o'clock uh, time limit here. Some of you have been sitting here for two hours. So uh, <laughs> I think we'll, uh, we'll call it quits right now. Thanks again, Dale. And uh, please join us for cookies and coffee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.